Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Erin Tynan, and I'm going to be your host um, for today. And I just wanted to start off um, saying thank you for joining us for our 2023 Living Wealth Wednesday series. Um, I, like I said, I'm Erin and I'm the Pottawatomie County Family Consumer Science Agent. Um, our Living Well Wednesdays is a virtual learning series hosted by K-State Research and Extension, Family and Consumer Science, um, from by Family and Consumer Science professionals from across the state of Kansas. Many of our topics will touch on a wide variety of essential skills that will power, empower you and your family to live, work, and thrive. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, first off, please be respectful and open to others throughout the presentation. Feel free to put your um, questions or comments in um, the Q&A box or the chat box. I, I saw there was already one there. We'll do questions kind of at the end. Um, the Q&A box does have a feature where you can anonymously ask a question if you're more comfortable with that. Um, our monitor, Monique, will make sure to go over the questions at the end of the presentation. Today's session will be recorded and posted to our Living Well Wednesday website, along with other additional resources. You will be able to find all future and past programs on our website as well. Um, lastly, a friendly reminder, our Living Well Wednesday series will discuss a new topic each second and fourth Wednesday in February and March over the lunch hour. Be sure to check our Living Well website for additional details on registration and topics. Um, and just as a reminder, our um, KSRE is an equal opportunity employer, therefore we do not discriminate against anyone. So if there's a special request or concern that you need to allow you to take part in our programs, um, please reach out to us. Um, and so next I'll get to our presenter. Um, we wanna thank Dom Kavakia um, for joining us today. He is a staff attorney for Kansas Legal Services, which is a nonprofit law firm and community education organization that helps low and moderate income people in Kansas. He is a member of the Kansas Bar Association's Elder Law Section and the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. And before becoming a legal aide, Dom worked for a small private law firm practicing primarily probate, estate planning, and Medicaid planning. Dom received his Juris Doctorate from Washburn University School of Law in 2019. And in addition to graduating with Dean Honors, Dom earned certificates with distinction in estate planning and tax law. While he's not busy helping his clients navigate legal issues, Dom enjoys putting his BA in theater to good use by volunteering in various technical roles on productions at the Manhattan Arts Center. And with that, I will turn it over to Dom. Thank you, Aaron, and everyone should be seeing my slides now. Um, Aaron, is that okay? All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. So, yes, my name is Dom Kavigia, and today we're going to be talking about estate planning essentials. Uh, and I'm subtitling this presentation "Estate Planning Essentials: A Matter of Life and Death." So, why do I say a matter of life and death? Other than, as you heard, I have a BA in theater, and I do like to be dramatic. I uh, want to make sure we're all awake and paying attention on the middle of the day of the middle of the day of the middle of the week. Um, but also one of my big takeaways that I hope you'll get out of the presentation today is that estate planning isn't just about death. I know a lot of people are hesitant to really think about estate planning because it's, it's just no fun to think about what happens when we're gone. But I hope you'll understand after today that some key legal documents that everyone should have will also help during life, not just after death. Um, as the introduction was given, so I won't spend too much more time talking about me, but Dom Kavikia, staff attorney, um, have memberships with the Kansas Bar Association. I've been practicing law now for a couple of years and before coming to legal aid, I did practice probate, which is the actual process by which the court executes estate plans and helps people and families after a loved one has died to manage those affairs, that's probate. I did a lot of that as well as the actual estate planning and a focus on Medicaid planning for families with loved ones who were going into a nursing home and facing long-term care and trying to figure out how do we preserve assets if we can 
uh, navigate the pretty tricky rules that go on when it comes to getting government assistance to help pay for end of life care. Um, I graduated from Washburn University in 2019. I have certificates in estate planning and tax law specifically. And again, um, theater was my original degree and still a passion. So I hope you find this informative and hopefully slightly entertaining as well. Um, as was said, I work with Kansas Legal Services. It's a fantastic organization. We help low income Kansans with all kinds of problems um, and access to law and attorneys they otherwise might not be able to afford. Uh, we provide assistance in areas of domestic and family law, landlord tenant, consumer protection, elder law, juvenile law, education law, disability, and, and even others. Um, our focus is always going to be on the most vulnerable, uh, the abused, the neglected, the elderly, disabled, and children. If you or someone you know needs help, please call our intake line. It's the number here on the screen, the 800 number, and um, one of our specialists will help figure out if you are someone we can help or aid. So again, there's that number. Uh, in addition to the intake line, we also have an elder law hotline. So if you or someone you love is a Kansan over the age of 60, you can get free legal advice by calling this number posted here. Um, it is possible for us to help you over the phone. We will. There are trained attorneys who can give advice on that line, but also you can request in-person meetings and they can also help you that way if you're an elder to get set up in our office. We do estate planning documents like wills, powers of attorney. Um, but also sometimes we can help elder folks with divorces, protections from abuse, and even landlord tenant cases. So estate planning essentials, a matter of life and death. Um, really, first, what, what is an estate plan? So what is an estate and how can we plan for it? And the, the picture I have here is of a, a chessboard um, because I think a lot of people tend to overthink how complicated this is. And I want to say, yes, there are complexities. And it definitely is something we recommend you seek a, a licensed attorney to help you think through. Um, but it's not nearly as complicated as chess. I've, I've helped a lot of people with estate plans, and I'm a terrible chess player. So just throwing that out there. If, if you can play chess, you probably can do an estate plan just as well as I can, uh, perhaps even better. And if you can't play chess at all, you can still do an estate plan. And again, let's talk about it. So um, what are the essential legal documents everyone should have? So an estate plan is going to consist of a number of documents, and there are some differences. So depending on your situation, um, you know, your, your actual facts and circumstances may need more or less of certain documents to help with certain things. But the big three, in my opinion, that everyone should have is a last will and testament, powers of attorney, and a living will. And that's what we'll talk about today. So getting back to that general question of what is an estate? And I know for me, the first thing I think of when I hear estate is I think of an, like a classic country estate or a European villa, you know, house and property. And honestly, that's not too far from the truth. Um, estates consist of real property, which is what the legal term is for land and homes. But an estate is not for legal purposes, and we're talking about today, not just the land and the home. It can be cars, it can be cash, all the money you have, whether that's cash in the wallet, coins on the couch, whether you've got a rainy day fund under the mattress, that's part of your estate. Also, digital assets, more and more. So here are kind of stocks, bonds, investments. Um, cryptocurrency is something that now is part of estates. Uh, and then also, if you have uh, digital accounts, we don't really think about this as property, but to some extent, our, our email accounts, our social media accounts, other accounts are things that if something were to happen to us and we were to need help managing, or if we're gone, someone needs to manage after our deaths, those are also things that can be considered part of our estate. So ultimately, when we're asking that question, what is an estate? The answer is it's, it's, it's stuff all this stuff, real and personal property. So even shoes, bags, hats, clothes, all personal property, anything you own um, is your stuff, is your estate. And so the next question is, how can we plan for that? And something that I think is often overlooked and something I hope you're not considering because you're here today to talk about it, but option one is always do nothing. And the law accounts for that. So option one is do nothing, and we call that intestacy. 
and testacy is the state of dying without a will. So briefly, what happens if you, after today, say, you know, this is overwhelming, I'm still not sure. If you feel that way, I highly recommend you call our line or go find a private attorney and talk about it because I do rec think that everyone can benefit. But if you aren't able to, or you, if you have a loved one who didn't do this planning, uh, option one in testacy is there as a default. What will happen is your assets, your stuff, are then managed through the court process of probate, and it will go by default uh, in the way that our state legislature in Kansas, and so this varies from state to state, but each state has its own state laws that governs what happens to people's property when they die. And in Kansas, our default is if someone is married when they die and they have no kids, everything goes to their spouse. If someone is single when they die and they have kids, everything goes to their kids. If they're single, they have no spouse, no kids, then we go back up the family tree and take the property and give it back to the parents. If they are both alive, we divide it half to mom, half to dad. Um, and if there's only one parent, it all goes to that parent. And it gets more complicated if also there are no parents because then we go um, out to aunts and uncles and possibly down to cousins. And if there's not that, maybe up to grandparents and we can kind of go all the way through the branches of the tree. If we do that and we've gone six steps and we still don't find anyone, which is pretty rare, but it can happen, then there's a big legal term called a sheet. You don't have to remember it. There won't be a quiz, but it's a term that means your stuff then goes back to the state. So if you haven't done your planning and there's not someone within six steps on your family tree, well, then the state gets your stuff. And most people don't want that. So it's good to think about, especially in that situation, if you don't have a loved one on the family tree to take, you'd rather give to a charity or family and friends, you don't want to be intestate when you die. You want to have done some planning and thought about it. Um, but that option is always there. Now, if you are married and you have kids in the state of Kansas, the default that the state has decided most people would want is a split 50-50 between the spouse and the kids. And I found in my practice that that's not always true for most people. Most people, if they have a spouse um, with a strong relationship and the kids are the kids of both parents, um, they'd say, well, I want my spouse to have a lot. I trust them to manage that for our children, especially if they're minors. Um, but even if they're adults now and they're living their own lives and they don't need the money, then why should they get it if my wife or my husband is still alive? So, um, but the default is if you don't be planning, half to spouse, half to kids. And if those children are still minors and they're getting half of all of your stuff, your property, your land, your money, your stocks, whatever that may be, that could be quite a bit of money and your spouse will probably then have to um, work with an attorney to get what's called a conservatorship or some additional work done after the fact to allow them to help the children manage that new wealth. So again, intestacy is always an option, but it can lead to some interesting results that you may not expect. So the better option, in, in my opinion, is option two, which is take action. And I've put here, become a testator. So this is another one of those fun Latin legal terms. What does that mean? That just means a person who has made a will. Um, so a testator, or if you're going to play the Latin game, which is masculine and feminine words, we also have the term testatrix for a woman who's made a will. Again, no pop quizzes, don't worry about it. The important thing is you have a will or you don't. But if you do, if you're testate, you have a will, you can then direct what you would want to do. You can say to the court, I know what the state said, the options are, but this is where I think my stuff should go. This is what I want to have done. So that's really step one of estate planning is decide, are you comfortable with the fallback, the default of nothing, or do you want to have your wishes made known? So the essential documents include not only a will, we've talked about what happens to your stuff, but you also want to have a power of attorney. And there are uh, a few distinctions we'll talk about with powers of attorney. Typically, you can have a single document, but often people will have two. They'll have one for finance, one for healthcare, and we'll talk about that in more detail later. But what a power of attorney document does is it names an agent. Sometimes that's also called an attorney in fact. Again, multiple terms meaning the same thing, which is you have picked someone 
to help you while you're still alive. With your will, the will is about what happens to your stuff when you're gone. But for a lot of us, we can reach a point in our lives, whether it be through, through an accident, disability, or old age, where we get to a point where we can't manage our own things during our own lifetime. Or even if we still can, we prefer to have someone else that can help us in the event of a tragic event, or if we're just unavailable. And that's what the power of attorney allows. You name someone through a legal document and give them authority to act on your behalf and essentially in your shoes to do a number of things. And we'll talk about how that can be financial or medical with healthcare. And then the other one we're gonna talk about today is a living will. And this gets confusing because we've already talked about a will. When we talk about a will, we usually mean last will and testament, the one up top. That's what to do with your stuff. A living will um, is sometimes also called um, an advanced directive. It's a medical decision that you make and that you will indicate whether or not you want to be kept on long-term life support. So this is a very personal decision, but it allows you under Kansas law to create a document that tells anyone who reads it what your wishes were if you were to end up in a state where you can no longer have your wishes known because you're in a long-term coma or terminal illness, something where you're not able to communicate, you can do a document now to let your loved ones know what you want them to do in that situation. And that can be a big relief. Uh, so they don't have to try to make that decision themselves, especially if they don't agree. So more details on the last will and testament. It tells the court where you want your stuff to go when you're gone. Um, you also, through the will, name a person, a personal representative or an executor, executrix. If it's a woman, again, we usually will say personal representative is a gender, gender neutral term. Somebody who can go to the court under the will and make sure that your stuff goes where you wanted it to go. You get to pick that person if you do a will. If you haven't done a will and you're relying on intestacy, it's really whomever goes to the court and says, hey, I, I think this needs to get done and I think I'm the right one to do it, the court will then pick someone. But under a will, you get to make that choice yourself. Who do you trust in your life? A spouse, a different loved one, one of the kids who's, if maybe one is more financially minded, just you get to choose who you want that person to be. You can also, in a last will, name a guardian of your minor children. So if you are a parent with young kids and are worried about, or you know, thought about if something happens to me, um, where, where, who's gonna look after my children? And you may have an idea of who you want that to be, but from a legal standpoint, if you don't have that determined and written down, um, it, it may come out differently than, than you thought. Um, and again, this is more important if you know, there are two parents or single parents, if both parents are gone, who's gonna then watch the kids? Uh, courts without direction will always, and even with direction, will always look into the best interests of the children. They're going to try to determine based on the evidence what is best for the kids. Well, you can say through a will, as the kid's parent, as a natural parent, I want this person. I am saying through my will, it is in the best interest of my children to be looked after this person. And that will carry great weight with the court if it's documented in the will. With wills, I advise caution. There are many legal formalities that have developed over the history of wills. Wills started way back under English law and they, at the time they were always handwritten. Then we went through typewriters and computers and the law still is kind of slow to catch up. And so there are these formalities that have been built up over time that have to be followed. Um, now current requirements for a will are that they're notarized. So there has to be a notary public who sees you sign and verifies from your ID who you are and stamps their stamp. And then you also have to have two disinterested witnesses. So you cannot have your spouse or your kids, anybody who's related to you or who would take under your will. So if you're leaving something to the neighbor, the neighbor can't be your witness because they're getting something out of it. So you have to have a notary and two disinterested witnesses. And then there, even then there are requirements as to how that signing occurs. Uh, there have been cases in the past where um, one of the witnesses was in the other room when 
the person making the will signed their name because they weren't in the same room and didn't actually see it with their own eyes, even though they later signed it, the court said that's not a valid will because it didn't meet all the requirements of having these people all together at the same time signing these documents. And so my takeaway there is do, do not try this at home. Um, if, you, if you're thinking about your will, you can definitely think about it, definitely do independent research, get some ideas. But when it comes time to actually put ink to paper on a document as important as a will, I strongly advise you, you discuss it with an attorney and make sure that you, you know what those formalities are because there's always the chance uh, that something later could, could come in to show that it wasn't done right and then you, you don't have a valid will. Um, so I definitely recommend discussing that um, with, with an attorney. So moving on to powers of attorney, we've talked about two types, financial and healthcare. Now, these can be in the same document. And if you are naming the same agent to help you with both, it often could make sense to have one document in one place that says, here are the financial powers, here are the healthcare powers, and here's the one person who can do those things. A lot of people, though, will give those different jobs to different people, different hats, different roles. Sometimes you may have one loved one who's really good with money management and another one who you think you trust more to make medical decisions with you and for you. Um, and so the cool thing about powers of attorney is you get to choose those people and they don't have to be the same person. It's up to you. Um, but again, financial is going to help you manage your money and stuff. Healthcare is going to help with medical decisions. Now, under any power of attorney, whether financial or healthcare, you are what's called the principal. You are the one who made it. You're the principal, they're the agent. And if you think about it like a principal at the school, that means you're the boss. And if you want something and say something, your agent can't say, I disagree and go do it anyway. They have to do what you want. And as long as you have the ability to say what that is and they know it, the law requires that they act in your interest at your direction. However, if you get to a point where you cannot express your wishes, um, this often comes up in medical scenarios. And my example would be, if you're in the hospital and they say, do you want the surgery? Blink once for yes and twice for no. If you can blink to the doctors and communicate, they're gonna listen to you. You're still the principal. But if you can't do that, they may need to look to your agent to say, here are the risks, here are the options, what should we do? And if you've got that healthcare power in place, it's very clear who you trust to make that decision. And it's important if you do make someone your agent, whether that's financial or healthcare, that you tell them that you've made them your agent and that you have open conversations with them about how you would want them to react in these situations. So Financial, again, financial is stuff. Well, if we talk about it, there's a lot of stuff. Stuff can be banking, stuff can be your home, stuff can be contracts. Basically your financial power of attorney, your, your financial agent uh, can stand in your shoes to do anything you would normally do. If you're a business owner, you can give your financial power of attorney the ability to help run your business. If you're uh, disabled or unavailable, um, you can give them the ability to, you know, access bank accounts, to access um, stock accounts, to make and enter into contracts. Um, oftentimes, if someone is comes to me needing help as an attorney, they need an attorney's help, but they are of an age or under a disability where they can't communicate for themselves, I will look, ask to see if the person coming to me is the power of attorney who has the right under the document to hire a lawyer on behalf of the person who can't do it themselves. So financial powers of attorney can be very broad. Um, but again, when you're picking your agent, you want someone you can trust because this person is going to have great power to help manage your affairs. Another one specific to Kansas, here I have on the slide, selling your home. In Kansas, in the Kansas constitution, we have what's called a homestead right. It's a very protective part of the law that says our homes are our homes and they should not be sold or otherwise given out from under us without our explicit consent and say. And so a general power of attorney prepared in another state or just a very simple one like you might find online is unlikely to have the necessary language to give your agent the authority needed 
to sell your home if it were to be needed. And I saw this a lot in Medicaid planning and with elder clients, if a loved one has gone into a nursing home and the doctors say, you know, there's really no way they're gonna be able to return to the home. Perhaps it's, you know, at that time, the family has to consider, do we keep paying the utilities, the heating, the electric on this home where no one's living or does it make more sense to sell it and have the extra cash in the bank to help cover medical costs and comfort care for the loved one? If the person in the nursing home didn't have a financial power of attorney with proper homestead provisions, the family may not be able to get the authority they need to sell the home unless they go to court. So again, a lot of these documents are gonna be very helpful for deciding things now, granting power to others now so that they can do things later without having to go to court and seek court approval, which can be a much more expensive and much more time constraining uh, process. The healthcare power of attorney, again, is for uh, medical decisions. A differentiation term sometimes, they're still an agent under a power of attorney, but we'll often call them the healthcare agent. The healthcare agent's powers can be broad as well, but they're really about medical decisions for the most part. Some of the decisions they can make, this is by no means an exhaustive list at only three points, but some of the things they can do is approve or disapprove of treatment plans. They can hire and fire doctors. So if you're unable to do that yourself and they don't think the doctor is the best doctor for you, they can get a new doctor. Um, if you are in a hospital setting and they don't believe that you're getting the treatment that's best for you, they can make decisions to have you transported to another hospital if that's in, again, these powers need to be in the document. So it's good to have a broad document that's very descriptive of what the agents can do. Um, again, it's kind of a running theme. I, I advise you seek legal advice from an attorney for your circumstances. And I will always say that, and I'm probably gonna say it a few more times. So I'm sorry if I sound uh, like I'm repeating myself on that, but the best advice I can give today on a presentation like this is definitely consider um, seeking direct advice from an attorney on your circumstances. Um, let's see. Another thing to think about when we're talking about healthcare situations, another thing to remember is HIPAA. So the HIPAA laws, you probably heard HIPAA talked about, especially a lot during the recent pandemic, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It really comes into play for most people in terms of privacy. And this is the law that says our doctors can't go around telling people our business. We can't have nosy neighbors going into our doctors and the doctor saying, oh yeah, this is the medical condition your neighbor has. But what that also means is that unless you give specific authorization for your loved ones to talk to your doctors, they could be left out of the loop. And we definitely don't want that if you're giving someone healthcare power. So a good healthcare power attorney is also gonna have HIPAA waiver language that says, here's the person making my medical decisions, definitely do talk to them about what my conditions are. And so you can include that in your power of attorney. And the last document we're gonna talk about specifically today um, is the living will. And so we talked about it briefly, the living will is um, a declaration about your wishes regarding life sustaining treatment at end of life. In Kansas, it's known under the Kansas Natural Death Act. Um, it's not a very creative name, but a lot of statutes are named very clearly for what they are. This is about your right to determine um, whether or not you're kept alive artificially, essentially. This is really, should, should they pull the plug? Would you want them to pull the plug is another way of saying it. Uh, it's a written declaration instructing to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining procedures in the event of a terminal condition. And that raises the question, what are life-sustaining procedures? Well, that's a medical procedure which when applied would serve only to prolong the dying process. And a lot of people's concerns when it comes to living wills are, you know, well, I don't want the doctors to not try to save me. Um, another concern I hear a lot is, well, what if there's someone who needs a transplant and I'm a match or they can not help me if I have a living will? And that, that's not what we're talking about. This is when you have 
a truly diagnosed terminal condition. And oftentimes the documents will say, and, and the ones that we will draft will say two or more. So your attending physician and another physician, two independent professionals agree that you are not gonna recover and have meaningful life. That all we're doing here is providing treatment that is just prolonging the dying process. This is sometimes confused with do not resuscitate. This is not a DNR. This is not a do not resuscitate. That's a medical order by doctors. And that's the one that is more restrictive that says you don't want any attempt to, to save you or help you if you've got a DNR. And that's not a legal document and that's not really something attorneys do. That's something to talk to a doctor about. But again, the real help of a living will, one, the state of Kansas has said, you have a right to make that decision while you are of sound mind and before you find yourself in a position where you can't express your wishes. You have a right to say it and put it in writing. It can be really, really helpful for your loved ones if you are in that position to have already made that decision for them, to have your wishes known, to have it expressed in writing so that it's clear to everyone that that is what you want. Um, again, like all legal documents, there are certain formalities that must be met. In this case, the statute says either two witnesses or a notary. But again, anytime you're executing or signing a legal document, my advice, here I go again, and I'm sorry, is seek legal counsel from an attorney about your specific situation and making sure that it's done right. Because, you know, it's almost, it's just as bad as having nothing to have attempted to do something and have it not be valid. In fact, it can be even more confusing uh, if you do try to do a do it yourself and it and it's not really there because then that can just create more confusion. Um, the last thing I was including on this slide, again, kind of pointing out, this is not a do not resuscitate. This is a living will. Uh, don't try to do this. Don't go get the tattoo that says do not, uh, or in this case, this person did put living will on a tattoo on their arm. That, that's not what we're talking about. That's not the way to do it. I, I appreciate what they tried to do here, and they even have some signatures. It's pretty creative, but that, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. See an attorney, get good legal documents, Again, your estate plan, a last will and testament, what to do with your stuff. Powers of attorney, naming someone to help you with both money and with medical decisions. And then last and certainly not least, a living will if you want to express your wishes as to end of life care. We should have, I think, plenty of time for questions. Do we have questions? Yes, Dom, there are a couple of questions in the question and answer. Uh, the first one is, I am just finishing my trust. I want to make sure I have all the documents I need. I have a will, DPOA for my home, DPOA for health care, and living will. Does this cover it all? Okay. So, and as I'm sure you've probably heard me say, this is where I'm going to say it again, when it comes to does it cover it all for you? Um, that's something you need to talk to an attorney directly about your situation. Uh, as you note, uh, I see in this question, you have a will, powers of attorney, and a living will. So those are the big ones I talked about. Um, I see it says DPOA for your home. Um, I would question if that's true financial. Is it just the home? Is it just for that homestead power or is it the full financial? But again, as to if it's going to cover it for you, it's a question about how much do you have and what things are you wanting to accomplish with your estate plan? So that sounds like you're on the right track for sure. Those are definitely those documents that I would be looking for if you came to, to seek advice and say, what do we have? Do we have it? But I can't say for sure, yes or no, for anyone's specific position without you know having spoken to that person further for all of their uh, independent individual needs. Okay. The next question is, I've noticed some people have placed land into a trust. How does one do that? And does that change anything when one passes on? Great question. So let's talk briefly about trusts. Trusts are another form of estate planning. They historically were developed um, oftentimes for tax purposes. And when people hear trust, a lot of times people think, trust fund babies, they think Rockefeller, and that's not necessarily true anymore. Trusts are really well developed. What a trust is, is it's an additional document. It's not totally a will alternative, 
but a trust is a legal document that creates a separate legal entity that manages your things, whether that be land or money, for your benefit. Uh, and it's called a trust because you're trusting the person managing it to manage it for your benefit, and you're separating the equitable or the fair use from the legal ownership. You're giving legal ownership to a separate entity, the trust, while you're retaining the equitable or the fair use of the property. Um, definitely seek the advice of an attorney if you're going to attempt a trust. Um, but even if you have a trust, you still need a will. We call that a pour over will. It's a very simple will that says, I have a good trust. I made a trust. If I forgot to put anything in it, my will says, please move my stuff into my trust. By doing that, you can attempt to do what's called probate avoidance. I know we can't cover all of probate avoidance today, but briefly the idea is with a trust, you're saying, I don't want the court to do my stuff under a will. I trust this trustee that I've named to manage my stuff outside of the court and to manage it without court intervention. That can be beneficial for a number of reasons, but it can also be more expensive if you're hiring a bank to be your trustee. And it could also um, means there's no court oversight. So if you've got somebody under a will who goes to the court and says, let's do this stuff under the will, the court knows what's going on and can say you're not doing it right, or yes, that's the right way to do it. Where with a trustee, you're really giving them a lot of authority. And if they do something wrong, then your beneficiaries, your kids, your heirs to challenge a trustee, then would have to try to pull that into court. And it can be more complicated than just having the court involved from the get-go. So trusts are not what I would call an essential estate planning document, which is why we didn't talk about them a lot today. You don't have to have a trust, but it can be another tool that can be useful in the right situation. So again, talk to an attorney about whether or not it's right for you. Okay, the next question is, who has to pay for debts if a loved one dies without finances to pay? Okay, so debt questions are, are tricky. Um, again, it, I, you'd have to ask about the specific debt. I will say typically and generally, unless there's state law saying otherwise, and there can be from state to state, but for the most part, the debts of your loved ones are not automatically debts of their kids, their heirs. That can be different. Again, if it's a spouse with a medical debt, we have what's called doctrine of, necess doctrine of necessities or necessaries, depending on who says it and whether or not I can say it today, um, where if you have a spouse that received ho hospital care, you as a spouse are deemed to be responsible for that as well because we provide care to our spouses under the law. But general debt may not necessarily fall on family members. So again, that's going to be one where you should really look at what the debt is, what are they asking for, where did it come from, what is it a debt for? Is it for medical care? Is it a debt from credit cards? Is it a debt from a number of things? And is someone attempting to collect it against you instead of the loved one who originally had it? And there's a lot of questions involved in debt. So um, Generally, not the family members, but definitely talk specifics with an attorney. Um, what do these legal documents potentially cost? Okay, so cost. Um, cost is gonna vary from, from provider to provider. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, it, it, this is the same with any good or any service, um, you'll get what you pay for. And from no most cases, definitely feel free to shop around, definitely ask attorneys what they charge, but it, it, it varies and it depends on complexity and what you need. So if you want something done that is very detailed, it's probably gonna cost more and probably take a while. If you want something very simple, it will probably be cheaper, but do again, I recommend you don't try it at home. Don't go find something free that you print off and try to fill it in. I mean. You can, but it most likely isn't going to accomplish what you're wanting. Um, and so I can't give a dollar amount, um, but I would advise that you ask attorneys that your most attorneys will tell you what they think these documents would run, or if they charge on an hourly basis, they can tell you how much they charge per hour and make probably an estimate about how much time they think your case will take. But again, it's gonna be a case by case basis. So I would ask up front and, and, and check around, but no, you get what you pay for. 
Okay, next question. What form do I need to put a second name on my house? I'm a widow with no parents or children, but want my siblings to have control. Okay, so I would briefly suggest that in a situation like that, I don't know, to, to change ownership of a house is something called a deed, but a deed may not accomplish what you're asking for. I hear you want to give control. Deed gives ownership, not control. So this is one where, you know, you would need to get, again, independently counsel, but um, you, you're, you're looking for, it really depends what you want them to do. Um, if you're talking about you want a home to go to them when you're gone, you could have an attorney help you set up a deed that transfers ownership at your death. It's called a transfer on death deed. But if you're transferring real estate, if you're selling a home, you need legal, legal help with a deed. You definitely need an attorney to prepare that. If you are divorced and have minor children, can you assign a guardian or do your kids automatically go to the other parent? So again, children, the question for courts is always best interest of the child. You can definitely nominate under a will a guardian, um, but again, the nomination is a factor that courts consider. They do tend to give it a lot of favor. And the question then would be, you know, why did this person name this person if there is another parent? Uh, and the question will be best interest. So you can't necessarily determine 100% what the court will do, but by naming a guardian or assigning a guardian, you're at least making your wishes known. So I hope that, that kind of helped clarify that. Okay. Um, are any of these good when you move to a different state? Great question. So, so yes. So if you move to a different state, documents you've done in one state should be honored by any other state, full faith and credit. So if you go from Kansas somewhere else, your Kansas documents should be honored in, in that state. Now, how it, that state does that is a matter of that state law. And I would advise, especially if you're getting property or real property, homes, land in the new state, that you seek an attorney in that state to double check your plan and make sure it's going to go under state laws. State laws are very controlling of land in states. And so when we're talking about our stuff or our state, the personal property may not change, but real property is going to be governed by state law, definitely. So wherever you go, I do advise you, you discuss your state plan with an attorney in that state to make sure it's still going to do what you want it to do in that state. But generally, it should be honored. Um, and as a general rule, even if you don't move, you should review your estate plan with an attorney every few years because circumstances changes. The people in our lives may come or go. And so definitely you want to review that pretty frequently. Great. Okay, next question. My parents have a will. They had medical power of attorney naming my sister and I. My dad recently died and I have created an S corp to manage his farms. Should I have a trust or estate plan developed in addition to this? I understand my mom cannot go into a nursing home go into nursing home care for the next five years, or we will lose all our farms. Does a trust address this gap? Okay, there's a lot there. As to the specifics of whether you need a trust or estate plan, um, I, I don't think that proper business planning, things involving businesses, is ever a full substitute for good estate planning. You probably will want both. Talk to an attorney. As far as going into nursing homes and trusts, Medicaid under Kansas, Kansas Medicaid does not like trusts. They don't favor them. Things that are in a trust are typically considered countable resources that could disqualify someone from Medicaid. So just as a general statement, trusts usually aren't the solution for a Medicaid plan, but that's a very detailed situation and you definitely need independent legal advice from an attorney who could help you address that. When starting the estate planning process and thinking about a will, would it be best to use an online template to start a will before meeting with an attorney? Or would it be better to meet with an attorney starting from scratch? Well, I, I don't think it would hurt, um, but each attorney is gonna have their own preferences. Uh, I wouldn't be offended if a client came to me and said, well, I, I started to fill this out. Chances are though, if it's a good, if, a will form is probably going to be very confusing to someone who's not legally trained. The, a lot of the language and the words may not do what you think it does. And so even if you do look at one, and it doesn't hurt, I don't think, to look at something, uh, but just be aware that your attorney is likely going to give you the better advice than the online form. 
And even if you've done some preparation, I would definitely recommend uh, you discuss that openly with the attorney you meet with and, and definitely you know, listen to them. If they tell you that something on that form is strange, they're probably telling it to you for a reason. So um, can't hurt, but also isn't necessary. All right, we got a couple more here. If the home is in the name of me and my spouse and my spouse passes in test state, would the house be split between me and my children? Okay, so that depends on how the home is in your name. In Kansas, at least, there are two typical ways we own homes. It's either as uh, tenants in common or as joint tenants with right of survivorship. Most spouses, if the deeds were done by an attorney and done well, probably have survivorship. If your deed says survivorship, then you're not in test date for that property. That is not a probate asset. If the deed is with survivorship, it automatically passes to the survivor. If it doesn't say survivorship and you have it as tenants in common, that means you each own an undivided half of the house. You own half of the house. And if you own half of the house only, the half that your spouse had would go half to you and half to your kids. And you could end up in a situation where you own three fourths of the home and the kids own a fourth of the home. But again, it depends on how you own that property. So definitely look at your deed. And if you're still not sure, talk to an attorney about what type of deeds you have and what would, would be the result if one of you were to pass. All right. Can a married couple get separate wills? Yes, married couples often do get separate wills. Um, and when it comes to estate planning, if you go to see an attorney together, they should be telling you that that's called joint representation. Uh, each person is entitled to have their own attorney and their own representation. And you have a right to go speak with an attorney on your own and do your own thing with your will, even though you're married. Um, but do be aware that oftentimes, if you have the same people you want to leave things to, if you have the same kids from the same marriage, it can be helpful to discuss all of that kind of as a big picture. But you do not have to have the same wills just because you're married. You can absolutely have different things under your wills going to different people. One more here. We paid off our loan but didn't receive the title to the house back. It's been several years. Should we pursue getting it back? Do we need an attorney to do it? Um, on that one, I would say that's one I can't really address under, it's not really estate planning, but um, I would start with an attorney. I would start with asking an attorney or at least calling up somebody who practices uh, real estate law, if you're not sure who, you could check with the title companies in your town if they know any good real estate attorneys. Um, but when it comes to, to title and questions like that, um, it, it can't hurt to talk to an attorney. Um, and I, I, sorry, I just don't have more further specific advice on that one. Okay, I think that is all of the questions in our chat and Q&A. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for, for having me here to present. I hope everybody who attended took something out of it. And again, if you took nothing else out of it, if you have questions, talk to an attorney. Yes, thank you, Dominic. Um, if you wouldn't mind stopping the share screen, I got one more slide to put up here. Um, thank you for taking time to do this presentation. It was full of great information. And judging by all the questions that we had, I think people learned a lot today. So um, thank you, it was, it was very informative. Um, so we encourage you all to take our um, survey that we have. Um, it's, I'm going to pull up this slide here, if you guys can see that. Um, it's the QR code um, on the screen. If you just want to use your phone to take, it's a real quick survey. Um, just asking you a couple questions. Um, and um, feel free to provide any comments or suggestions. Um, we welcome it all. We do these um, the second and fourth of every Wednesday. And so any way we can improve these, we appreciate. Um, our next program that we will have will be um, on February 8th, and it is going to be on hypertension awareness and prevention. Um, and lastly, if you need any additional information or resources, please reach out to your local extension agent. If you're not sure where your local office is, you can visit uh, ksre.kstate.edu and you will be able to hover over um, the county that you are in and find the location of your office. So again, thank you everybody for attending and we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.